Okay, in this video we'll talk about the mathematics of uh, quantum systems in finite dimensions. So this will be a pretty mathematical um, video, but I hope it sets the stage for then uh, talking about um, the connections with quantum mechanics in the next video. Um, so we'll talk about these quantum systems in finite dimensions, and uh, we've already seen two examples, each in uh, two dimensions. So um, we've looked at polarization states of photons, which can be polarized along the x or the y direction, or equivalently along the left-handed and right-handed um, polar uh, circular polarization states. And then we've seen the spin along the z direction, for example, which can take on the values of plus h bar over 2 and minus h bar over 2. So those are two spin states of an electron, or for example, a silver atom. And what I'm actually showing here are two um, two choices, or in, in, in the first case, even uh, um, two individual choices for that system. In the second case, one choice of a basis of the space that we're looking at. And so what we're looking at really are Hilbert spaces. And uh, so to get to the point of what Hilbert spaces are, let me go um, through a couple of different uh, substructures in that um, Hilbert space. So first of all, we have to introduce a group on our um, on our space. So, uh, or we have to introduce a group um, h comma plus, which is a group under addition. So the operation here is addition. The elements in h, for example, alpha and beta, um, satisfy the uh, uh, the ex the properties of a group. So if we have addition of alpha and beta, um, we get a new state, which we can denote as just alpha beta plus beta between the cat symbols. And that um, is part of the group that we started with. So this is the, the property of closeness. Um, the second property is associativeness. So um, if I first add the first two in an um, addition of three states, um, I can add first alpha and beta and then add gamma to that. Or I can add first beta and gamma and then add um, alpha in front of this. Okay. Um, so that's the associative property of this group under addition. And then we have um, a third property which introduces this null element. So every group has to have a null element. There must exist a null element such that for every element in the group, we can add this null element, either um, have alpha plus the null element or null element plus alpha. But in any case, we should end up with alpha again. So that's the null element or the zero, and we'll write it as either um, zero in this cat notation or just zero um, as, as a number, just kind of a sloppy notation because then we're not really making clear that this is an, an element of the group and it looks like a scalar. But for all intents and purposes, it, it acts like a zero um, from the, uh, as a scalar. Um, we add here a fourth property, um, which is that this, uh, this group is abelian because if we add um, alpha plus beta, um, it's the same as beta plus alpha, so it uh, satisfies this, this abelian um, property. The next thing we do is we expand our group h comma plus to h comma plus comma multiplication on the complex um, with the complex numbers. So this is now um, what, what expands this to a complex vector space. Um, it, it's the combination of H plus with um, C uh, under addition and multiplication on, on the complex numbers, which is a, a field. Um, so that adds some other um, properties, distributive behavior and stuff on top of the group behavior um, that we introduced here for H. Um, but since this is all uh, specific to the complex numbers has nothing to do with um, the, the properties of the Hilbert space and the properties of the, the states that we're considering here and of the vector spaces. Um, I, I won't go into that. Um, but so this becomes a complex vector space. Um, and again, it satisfies a number of properties, which, you know, they're all pretty obvious and I'm, I'm sure they won't surprise you, but for all elements of this uh, space, of this complex vector space, and for all complex numbers, I can multiply complex numbers in front or in the, or or uh, um, behind the the element of the vector space, and it gives me another vector space element. So again, we have this closed um, behavior. Uh, we can have uh, successive 
multiplications with scalars, which is equivalent to having um, first a scalar multiplication within our field, then multiplying that with the element of the vector space. And then there's an identity element for multiplication um, of uh, complex numbers with elements from our vector space, and that gives us again the same um, vector space element that we started with. And then finally, the, uh, the, the fourth property that I've listed here is that if I add um, two uh, scalars, B plus C, and multiply those with my um, uh, element from the vector space, then I'll end up, um, I'll, I'll basically be able to distribute this B plus C to, be, to have uh, B times A plus C times, um, or B times alpha plus C times alpha, okay? Um, we also have a null element in our, in our complex um, field, in uh, the field of complex numbers under uh, addition and multiplication, and that null element will give us, um, if we multiply that with any vector uh, state, that will um, return our null element of the, the vector space. So that is um, how the null element in our, our complex numbers is connected with the null element in our vector space. So once we have a vector space um, H, we can introduce a, uh, a dual vector space. So if we have our vector space here where our elements are, are indicated with, uh, with cat um, uh, notation, there's a dual vector space where we denote our elements with this bra notation, okay? Um, this is familiar notation to all of you. Um, and there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between all elements in this original vector space and in the dual vector space. So for every vector in the, the original vector space H, we can find a vector in this dual vector space. And the other way around, for every vector in the dual vector space, um, we can find an element in... Um, the original vector space. So that associates one bra with each cat and one cat with each bra and the other around. So um, there's this one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, but it's uh, it's something that, that's sometimes important to keep in mind is that we have these two spaces um, and that what we define um, in some sense uh, uh, relates back to these two spaces that have this one-to-one -one correspondence to them. So we can then, of course, uh, um, use the, the, the properties or, or expand the properties from our complex vector space where we uh, have introduced scalar multiplication um, and we can expand um, our, our description here to include this dual vector space. So if we have a, multiplication, a scalar multiplication of a, of a state from our original vector space with a complex scalar C, then we'll get um, uh, the C, the complex conjugate of C is a multiplication in dual vector space. Um, if we have just addition in our vector space, we get addition in the dual vector space. If we have a, a, a scalar linear combination, then we'll get the, the, the dual linear combination with, but with uh, complex conjugate on the coefficients. Okay, nothing surprising here. So now that we have uh, um, a vector space and a dual vector space, we can define an inner product on elements from one, from the, the vector space and from the dual vector space with each other. So this inner product or scalar product takes one element from our dual vector space, one element from our original vector space, and then produces a complex number out of it. So in this case, it takes um, the, the element alpha from our dual vector space, it takes the element beta from our vector space, and we, we get a, a complex number, okay? Again, there's some properties. There's uh, linearity. So if we have um, alpha inner product with beta plus C times gamma, then we'll find the inner product of alpha and beta plus C times the inner product of alpha and gamma. That's our linearity on the cat side. Um, conversely, there's anti-linearity on the brass side. So we have uh, beta plus C times gamma inner product with alpha gives us beta times alpha plus C conjugate times gamma um, inner product with alpha. So that's because of the second property that um, if we uh, invert uh, the, the roles of, of the elements that we picked from the dual and the original vector space, 
then we'll find a, an inner product that's complex conjugate. So what we're actually doing here is, is um, using this property that um, for each element in our dual vector space, there's, an, or there's a one-to-one -one correspondence to our elements in uh, the original vector space. Because our, um, our, our inner product is, uh, um, it, it can be, uh, can be turned on its head in this way and, and we get the complex conjugate, we can show that this is a positive definite inner product or scalar product um, if we uh, um, apply the, the, the inner product to a state and its, and its corresponding state in the dual vector space, then we find a real number. Um, and moreover, if this real number is equal to zero, that is only possible if and only if um, the state itself is zero. So that's the definition of a um, positive definite inner product or scalar product. So now let's step back. We have our vector space, um, which uh, we, we've introduced here, a complex vector space that uh, is, uses uh, the, the addition in the vector space and then multiplication with scalars. And then of course relies on the fact that we have a, a field of complex numbers where addition and multiplication are defined as well. So if we combine that now with this inner product or scalar product, then we get a Hilbert space. Okay. Um, so that is the definition of a Hilbert space. Uh, technically, there's another, uh, you know, th this is the fine print. Um, we also have to be able to, uh, to basically write a, a Cauchy series that converges to a point that is inside um, the Hilbert space. We should not be able to write a, a to, to construct a series like that that um, um, that does not converge to a point or that converges to a point that is that falls outside of the Hilbert space. Basically, it means no holes in this space. Um, we've already introduced some examples um, without really thinking about it, but you're familiar with other examples of Hilbert spaces. For example, the um, vectors of complex numbers. Um, if we have vectors of, of n-dimensional complex numbers, then uh, and, and we use as an inner product the um, the regular you know uh, vector multiplication and of course we're using complex numbers so we have to use um, the, the the Hermitian conjugate here then we end up with a, a properly defined inner product um, and we end up with Hilbert space similarly if we use complex valued functions on some finite domain um, think about for example the um, uh, infinite um, potential well between zero and L, a distance L, um, then we can also define a, a, a complex, uh, define an inner product on this through an integral um, where we have F star G um, integrated over the domain from zero to L. So that's again an inner product that um, turns the complex valued functions on that finite domain into, uh, into Hilbert spaces. So all good and well, um, th these are our Hilbert spaces. Now there's one other thing that will be important for quantum mechanical description that's related to, uh, to the normalization. So uh, we, we do use one additional aspect of um, the Hilbert spaces or, or we add an additional um, uh, requirement on our, our Hilbert spaces is that, and that is that we only assign meaning to the rays in um, this Hilbert space. So to understand what a ray is, we first have to introduce what is a, a subspace is. So any subspace is, of course, a vector space that is um, part of the Hilbert space, such that that vector, such that that subspace is a vector space on its own. So it satisfies all of the um, above requirements. And one um, type of subspaces are rays. Rays are one-dimensional subspaces of H where um, alpha and C alpha, um, so the uh, complex scalar multiplied with alpha um, are, are all of the elements. So, uh, so we have alpha and then uh, for all values of C, um, they're, they're, we, we obtain um, the other elements in, uh, in, in that ray. So uh, basically think of it as um, a, a ray um, in, in the complex plane, for example, where uh, you just multiply um, a, a, a scalar that gives the distance from, uh, from the origin. Okay, so that's an example of a ray um, in, in a two-dimensional plane as a vector space. Um, of course, here we can multiply complex numbers with our alpha 
um, and still describe the, the same state. So later when we come back to the postulates or when we introduce the postulates of quantum mechanics, then uh, we'll talk about how physical st states are described by these rays. So one state corresponds to one ray um, in, uh, in the Hilbert space. And so um, what we'll do is we'll want to introduce a unique um, basis. I'll introduce basis in, in the next video. Um, but we'll want to introduce a unique basis for this uh, one-dimensional subspace. And to do that, we'll normalize our cats um, such that uh, they have uh, a unit norm. And uh, of course, I've, I've shown this here um, just by dividing by the square root of the inner product. And so that normalized basis factor of the ray, so that one-dimensional subspace, um, will correspond to a physical state. Um, this is mainly... Um, something I'm going through to indicate that we're doing something in addition to just uh, using a regular Hilbert space. Um, but most of this will be uh, relatively obvious as we use it in, uh, in, in applications. So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, no, no need to uh, make a big deal out of this. Um, it's just something to be aware of. Okay, I'll uh, talk in the next video about how to construct um, a basis for a vector space. Okay.